have to educate you here. The appropriate liturgical response is, and also with y'all. <laughs> Actually, that's not grammatically correct because contrary to popular belief, we do not use y'all in the singular. It's only a plural, but we won't go there. That's enough of that. I, um, I cannot begin to tell you how honored... Uh, but more than that, how humbled I am that you have asked me to serve in this role. All three of us recognize that um, we've been given a trust. You have, uh, you have entrusted us with the responsibility to lead our tribe. And I want you to know that um, we take it seriously and we accept it. As long as you promise to keep praying for us as you have over these last few weeks and months. And with the full understanding that apart from him, we can do nothing. I want to introduce you to my wife, Pam. I think she's over here. If you haven't already discovered, you'll soon discover that she got most of the personality in our partnership. And all of the funny. She got all the funny. I, you know, Bishop Roller uh, at uh, our last Alabama-Georgia annual conference uh, shared a little list of things that he has discovered about being a bishop. And at the top of the list was he said, I discovered that after I became a bishop, I suddenly got funnier. That uh, all of a sudden people started laughing at the jokes that nobody had ever laughed at. Well, uh, I want to give you full permission if you hint any, even a remote hint of, of, of humor, uh, feel free to laugh out loud. You will, I will not think less of you, I promise. Um, but I was talking about Pam, actually. <laughs> uh, Pam is the most real person I know. And um, she makes me so much better as a man and as a follower of Jesus. You are a treasure. And... Um, it means everything to me that you are with me. And it's been your mantra of whatever, not in a teenage voice, <laughs> but God, whatever. Our lives are in your hands. And uh, that mantra has kept us uh, moving through this process. Uh, Pam and I also have two sons and a daughter-in-law that we're so proud of. Andrew, our oldest, is here somewhere, uh, I think, if he made it on time. Uh, um, <laughs> he is a senior at Toccoa Falls College in North Georgia and in the pastoral ministry degree there. Our youngest son is Aaron, and he's married to Hannah May, which, by the way, she's not from the South. She was uh, born in Idaho and grew up in Indiana, but uh, we now claim her as a good Southerner. But... Um, she and Aaron are finishing up college and expecting our first grandson. I think that's the right way to say that. Uh, and I have to say a huge thanks to our parents and our siblings who have prayerfully supported us all these years in ministry and to our church family at Christ Community in Columbus, Georgia. Um, Pam and I planted Christ Community in our living room in 1997. And it was our delight to do, to do life with that fellowship for 21 years. And let me also say that our time was brief. I want to say to the southeastern region that it has been a blast to serve you since January of this year. Yeah. <laughs> a blast in more ways than one, I assure you. Uh, you know, I, I've got to say this. I, I, told, I told you, southeastern region, that we would be more than willing to take our name out of this process. And you said to us, stay in and let God do what God does. Amen. And I want you to know that uh, I told you that God would provide, and he will, because he always does. And I have to tell you what an incredible blessing these days have been. Uh, the worship has been so rich. Um, <clears throat> And the preaching so powerful. Uh, 22 years ago, Pam and I were church orphans. And uh, you adopted us on faith with no evidence whatsoever that we had anything to offer. We immediately 
knew we were home when the first time we were with you at that first annual conference, uh, Bishop Richard Snyder was our first bishop. And when he got up to speak and his lips trembled every time he spoke the name of Jesus, we knew we were home and we knew for the first time in our ministry what it was like to be under spiritual covering. We had it under Bishop Snyder. We've had it under these three bishops as well. And with God being our helper, we will, we will give the same to you as well. Um, our time is short. <laughs> and uh, I'm not yet in this role long enough to command more than the few minutes that we have. So... Uh, <laughs> Folks in Christ community will tell you it may not take long, but um, <clears throat> I'm going to bring you a very simple message from Exodus 33, and uh, if you want to go ahead and turn there, you can. I'm going to start in verse 1, but I do want to give you uh, just some context. I just want to remind you where we are in the story. Moses, uh, well, this was a time of crisis for Moses as a leader. It was a time of crisis for the, the people of Israel. Um, Moses had confronted Pharaoh. He had gone before the most powerful man in the world and demanded that God let his people go. The Israelites had seen the mighty hand of God in the plagues and in the parting of the Red Sea and in the provision of water from the rock and manna and quail. Moses had stood in the very presence of God and receive the Ten Commandments. And now he had gone back to the mountain, uh, again into the presence of the Lord, to receive instructions for the tabernacle and for worship. But after several days, the Lord said to him, Moses, you got to get back down to the camp. The people have become, become corrupt. My anger burns against them. Leave me so I can decide how I'm going to destroy them. So Moses came down the mountain and discovered that the people had grown restless, waiting on God to speak to Moses. They were expecting Moses to be gone for a few hours, maybe a few days, but not nearly as long as he had been gone. They wanted something tangible, something concrete, something convenient, something that they could pull off the shelf when they were in need, but conveniently ignore otherwise. And Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was none of those. And so they took the gold and they crafted a, a calf and they called it their God. It's when the first time they had sinned. They had complained when they were hungry. They had complained when they were thirsty. They had even said, Lord, just send us back to Egypt. But this was blatant idolatry. And so Moses cried out to God. He begged for mercy. He even offered his own life in payment for their sin. But the Lord's anger did not relent on that day. Judgment was passed on the whole nation. 3,000 people died on the spot. He sent a plague on the survivors. And then God said this in Exodus 33, beginning in verse 1. Leave this place. You and the people you brought up out of Egypt and go to the land I promise you on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Parasites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. Now you will be relieved to know that is not my text this morning. <laughs> that's, uh, that's still part of the background. It's what happens next that's critical. Moses took his tent outside the encampment and he travailed in prayer on behalf of a sinful nation. I wonder, by the way, if we have prayed so for our nation. I wonder if we've prayed so for our denomination, for our churches. 
Moses prayed, Lord, you've been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your way so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And to that, God finally relented, saying to Moses, my presence will go with you. To which Moses replied, if your presence does not go with us, then do not send us up from here. I want you to think for a moment about what God just offered the people of Israel. I mean, God actually says here, I will give you the land of promise. It's going to be a land that's flowing with milk and honey. I'm even going to send an angel before you. And you're going to have complete victory over all your enemies. God is essentially saying to Moses, I'm going to give you prosperity, I'm going to give you success, and I'm going to give you security. Three things that many people in this world would sell their soul to have. Let me put this in slightly different terms that may be a little more relevant for some of us here. It would be like God saying to a pastor, I'm going to send a squad of angels to drive out everyone who tries to squash your dreams. I'm going to send an angel before you uh, to, 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 to drive out all the control freaks who are constantly slowing you down. I'm going to send an angel before you to drive out all the thorns in your side who oppose you. And not only that, but I'm going to fill your church with double tithers. <laughs> and you're going to have a great salary. All your ministries will be funded, and you'll have a surplus every year to boot. And I'm going to make you the fastest growing church in the country. There are some pastors that would take that deal in a New York minute. But Moses never hesitated for even a second, never considered the possibility that those things might be a suitable substitute for the presence of God. Moses said, God, if we get prosperity and we get success and we get security, but we do not get your presence, I ain't buying. You know, Uh, we, we need to ask ourselves the question, why was Moses so adamant? Why was he so insistent? I will not take a step from this place without your presence. I, I believe we have the answer if we go all the way back to ex Exodus 3. That's when Moses had an encounter with God in the burning bush. And I know you remember the story. But there, and let me just remind you the context of that part of the story. Moses had been born at a time of persecution, been miraculously delivered by God. He grew up in the house of Pharaoh. He was a prince of Egypt. He was proud. He was confident. He was strong. But then he witnessed an Egyptian killing an Israelite. And in an act of vengeance, Moses killed the Egyptian, thinking surely that the Israelites would, would appreciate what he'd done, but instead they just grew suspicious of him. And so all of a sudden, Moses was a man without a people. He was enemy, uh, the enemy of the state in Egypt, and the Israelites wanted nothing to do with him. And so Moses fled to the desert. And there in the desert, among the sheep and the goats, for decades... Moses languished in anonymity, a broken, humiliated man. But it was in that moment that God came and spoke to Moses in a burning bush. And I want you to hear, you all remember the objections. Moses had them, I had them, you had them, right? We all had them when God called us. Moses had them first. And I want you to remember his objections, but more importantly, I want you to hear God's response to everyone. Moses cried out to God in Exodus 3.11, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? This was Moses' crisis of identity. Who am I, God? And I'll tell you who he was in his own eyes. He was a nobody. He was nothing. He was a broken man. 
And to that, God simply said to him, Moses, I will be with you. Exodus 3.13, God, Moses said, but, but suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? This was Moses' crisis of authority. Lord, what power stands behind me? How can I prove that, I, that you really sent me? Moses, God said to Moses, you tell them, I am that I am has sent you. God's very name means presence. I am with you. That's all the authority you'll ever need, Moses. Exodus 4, 1. But what if they don't believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? This was Moses' crisis of credibility. Why would they believe in me, God? What's going to validate me in the eyes of the people? How do I prove myself? I love this part. God says to Moses, what, Moses, what's in your hand? Moses says, my staff. God said, Moses, he didn't say this. I believe this is the message. <laughs> the message is, Moses, as long as you've got me, that stick in your hand is all you'll ever need. And then there's Exodus 4.10. Oh, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. This was Moses' crisis of adequacy. And I'll tell you what, I, I, there's no question I relate to every one of these crises. But this one in particular was one that I just could not overcome. I, I was, uh, when God first called me to be a pastor, I could not imagine. Yeah, I, I was one of the, I, I'm an introvert. I, I was sh painfully shy uh, when I was in high school. I never raised my hand in class because I was sure I would say the wrong thing. I was scared to death to speak in front of people. I, I couldn't even hardly give a testimony in front of people, a, a small group of people. And so when the Lord called me to be a pastor, I was like, Lord, how can I do this when I can't do that? God's word to, to me was essentially the same it is to Moses here, and I love what he says in the RSV translation. God says to Moses, literally, I will be with your mouth. I want you to see here that God's response to every fear, every objection is simply this, I will be with you. Moses chose to trust God, to believe his promise. He went back to Egypt. He confronted the most powerful man in the world. He witnessed firsthand the power of God going before him. And I want to tell you that in that experience, Moses learned that security is not found in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. <laughs> and courage. Courage is not found in the absence of fear, but in the presence of God. And adequacy is not found in the absence of weakness but in the presence of God. And all of that is why 30 chapters later in Exodus 33, when God says to him, I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, and I'm going to send an angel before you that's going to drive out all your enemies, and you will dwell in safety. Moses said, no deal. If we get all that, but we don't get your spirit, your presence, we're not taking one step from this place. Uh, I wonder what would happen in our movement if we were as convinced as Moses that the one thing we cannot do without is the presence of God. Amen. You remember David's cry in Psalm 52? Do you when Saul 
heard the news from Samuel that God had rejected him and that his spirit was no longer with him. Do you remember Saul's request to Samuel? Come with me so that I can save face before the people. Do you remember what David cried when he suddenly realized the depth of his sin? David fell on his face and his cry was, create in me a clean heart. Take not your spirit from me, O Lord. And that's why God called David a man after my own heart. The thing that David had to have more than anything else was I've got to know that you are with me. You know, when I think about that deal in Exodus 33, I'm fairly confident that if it were offered in such stark terms, uh, there are very few of us that would accept that deal. Uh, but it doesn't really happen that way, does it? It happens by degrees. It happens day by day by day. When God first called me to be a pastor... I knew without a doubt there was no way in the world I could do what God was calling me to do. I knew it wasn't in me. I knew that if God didn't show up, I was sunk. And so I will tell you that in those early days, I prayed desperately. But I confess to you that after a while, the desperation began to slip away. And I'll tell you that over the years, I began to discover there's some things I can do. And there's some things that uh, sometimes uh, I can do it even more expediently by my own design than by waiting on God. Little by little, just day by day, we start investing more time in leadership books and in conferences than we do getting on our face and crying out to God. Yeah. And I'm not speaking against leadership books or conferences, but I am speaking for getting on our face and crying out to God. Little by little, we can find ourselves, if we're not careful, putting more and more trust in our own gifts, our own skills, or, or, or even on the models and the strategies and the techniques of somebody else, rather than... Daring to believe that God could speak to us, that God could lead us, that God could bring a fresh move of his spirit among us if we just demanded God without your presence, we're not taking a step from this place. And one day we realize, in the words of Tozer, we have the bush pruned and trimmed and properly cultivated, but in the bush there is no fire. I want to ask you personally this morning, is there anything that you long for more than his presence? Is there anything that we've come to depend on more than his presence. I wonder if we have any Moseses in the house. I wonder if we have anyone this morning that would stand up and cry out, God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us out from this place. Is there anyone that would stand with me? And let's say this together as a people. Let's claim this promise as a people. Can we say it together? God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us out from this place.